welcome everyone. Uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about the Chung Mei home. It was in first in Berkeley, California, and then in El Cerrito, California. You know, as a Chinese at the turn of the century, um, life was very hard. Um, and there were some number of um, families who did okay, but the great majority of the families really struggled. And the, uh, there were some number of kids who unfortunately were neglected and abandoned. And that was the reason Chung Mei Home was founded um, by Dr. Shepard. And he was inspired by Donaldina Cameron. The home was originally in Berkeley, California. And of course, if you didn't know it, like if you were Chinese in those days, you could live anywhere you wanted, as long as it was Chinatown in San Francisco or Chinatown in Oakland. And it was almost earth shaking for this to go into Berkeley. So uh, exciting. Uh, because of the demand for services, uh, Dr. Shepard found a new place for the home in El Cerrito, California, and raised a ton of money. And this was the home in 1936. It was hardly luxury, but um, it was a great place for the kids. Okay. So how do I get on the... Um, these kids, as you said, they were, many of them were abandoned and neglected. They were considered incorrigible, uh, but you know, they ate together. You know, they brushed their teeth together. Everything they did together as a group. They bunked together. Um, they bathed together even. Um, it was all about building a cohesive community and Dr. Shepard really knew what he was doing. Um, they went to all our local schools in El Cerrito um, and the old time locals remember them marching in formation to the two local schools, uh, one before the war and one after the war. They needed to raise a lot of money, they did it many ways. One of those ways was by selling wood and they actually participated, the older uh, men at the facility, by helping harvest wood that they then brought back to first Berkeley and then El Cerrito to cut up and they sold it. You know, they went out to the Delta and they made money by picking fruit out near Lock and out near Walnut Grove. Their drum and bugle corps was famous. Um, this may not be a, a vehicle that they could use today, but it's a terrific picture. And actually here, right here is a Dr. Shepard in the back of the truck. They did occasionally get to take a break. Here they are at the river. Here's a terrific picture of them in uh, some later outfits. Um, they marched in many, many parades and performed at many, many events. Everybody knew them. That was 1938. Um, they had sports teams. And in fact, the locals, remember, they were fearsome competitors. Um, one old Italian guy told me they were faster and much stronger than they looked. And we knew we were going to have a tough game whenever we played them. The basketball team, as, he, as another guy, guy told me, they played very tall and very hard and never gave up. Um, and I think that's how Dr. Shepard would like it. Uh, in 1950, after the war, um, this was in an elementary school. Uh, the city champs was the Castro School, which is where the Chung, younger Chung Mei boys went in those days. And you see that team all Chinese, and there's three coaches in the back. And in those days, El Cerrito had 103 Chinese, and about 80 of them were at the home. Today, El Cerrito is about 25% Asian. We have a very large Chinese population. Those unwanted and incorrigible guys became amazingly successful. If you just can read the captions here, Clarence Chan will join one of the US services. Danny Chu will go east to go college. John Kwan will go to Los Angeles City College. Billy Lee is going to be successful. Gordon Lee uh, will go to college. Uh, Jim Wong will study pharmacy at Cal. Um, and if, unfortunately, Clarence Chan here died during the Korean War. Uh, several guys lost their lives during the 
or serving their country. Here's how this building looked today. And I say it changed my life too, um, because I actually got this building on the National Register and that was a big deal. But in the process of getting on the National Register, I became involved in several educational groups and that all led to me getting on the school board, which is an entirely <laughs> different event. And whether it's me or whether it's these guys, we have so much to thank the captain for. I wouldn't have led this last part of my life if it wasn't for the captain. And all the guys you're going to hear from tonight have been nowhere near as successful if it had not been for the captain. So thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to say great presentation by Tom Panis. It was I was really impressed with how you present it. Thank you very much. So good evening, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to the CHCP webinar. Hi, I'm Erwin Wong, uh, CHCP director of the speaker series. Today's webinar is about Chiang Mai, um, Chiang Mai uh, Home for Chinese Boys uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area that was established in the 1935 until they closed in 1954. But before I introduce the host for this evening's webinar, I would like to tell you a little bit about our organization and the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project, or for short, CACP. The Chinese Historical and Cultural Project is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1987 and is based in Santa Clara County, California. We promote, educate, and preserve Chinese American and Chinese history and culture through community outreach activities. And if you get a chance, please log on to our website. That's chcp.org and check out our virtual tour of our museum. A replica of the 1888 uh, Ingsheng Gung uh, that was constructed back in the 1980s, which by the way is located in the His History Park in San Jose, California. And as a note, um, during the webinar, if you have any questions, do not raise your hand, but instead, please log those questions on the Q&A icon. It is on top of your screen or on the bottom of your screen, okay? However, due to the time constraint uh, for this webinar, uh, we would do our best to answer as many questions as possible. So now, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our host for this evening's webinar. I call him the Renaissance Prince, my friend, Richard Marr. Thank you, Erwin. Welcome, friends of Chung Mei Ho. We are going to have a 30 minute presentation by four, three alumni and Tom Panis. We're going to start with Tom. And Tom, would you? continue with your dialogue and your relationship to Chung Mei and your, your role as past president of El Cerrito Historical Society and how it relates to Chung Mei. Tom, you're on. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, it's just a treat to be here. Um, as Richard said, I spent many years as the president of the El Cerrito Historical Society. And uh, the Zhong Mei Home, after it closed in 1954, had several different functions. Uh, it became a Baptist Bible college, it became a business college. After that, it became a private school. Um, and in the... Uh, about 2008, 2010, the private school closed and everyone was afraid that the Zhong Mei home might be torn down and rebuilt as something else. Uh, so a number of people started twisting my arm in like a horrible way. And I became much more familiar at that point with the history of the home. I knew a little bit about it. And I started meeting former members um, and I decided the best way to make sure we never lost this incredible relic would be to try and get it on the National Register. Um, in the process of doing this, you know, I've collected many different photographs. Uh, some of those slides we saw were from an amazing collection of lantern slides. 
Um, those are glass slides that have been artificially colored that Paul Chan gave me. Other sources for photos, I'm sorry, Phil Chan gave me. Um, other sources for photos, but like all that material became key to convincing the state and the federal uh, register administration that this truly was a worthy site and um, deserved to become registered as eligible for listing on the National Register. Um, and in doing that, I came to know the, the people who actually bought the building and they actually put it to use as another school. But then I spent a lot of time working with them uh, after their initial shock of me putting on the National Register <laughs> and helped them preserve it uh, and they have done an amazing job of stewarding that building. They paid for several plaques. There's a beautiful plaque of Dr. Shepard inside the building. Uh, we are so fortunate that this family foundation bought that building and continues to use it as a school. It is a classic cultural resource and historic landmark in El Cerrito. And I'm so proud of the part I've done, but even better, um, the people who I have met as part of that process have really enriched my life. That's the, the gentleman you see here tonight and a number of other people in the community. Thank you, Richard. All right, thank you, Tom. Now we're gonna have the actual people who have really lived at Chung Mei Home. We're gonna start with Paul Chan and Paul, was in 1945 to 1952. Paul, you're on. Okay. Um, yes, I was there when I was only six years old when I was put there, and I didn't, didn't know why or what happened, but I was there, and the first day I was there, I cried. I had a little teddy bear that I grabbed for security just to keep me working, and then in a few days, I met a lot of friends there, or people that became friends, and then everything was it was a okay with me, and I learned what it was all about. And I'm giving you the point of view of a six-year-old to a twelve-year-old, probably the youngest ones there. But um, what I remember is first we all had jobs to do, and uh, th there were home home functions that helped make Jung Mei work. Um, we had to clean bathrooms, make beds. Uh, we had to work in the kitchen, do pots and pans. Uh, we had to be waiters to serve food. Then we had to go into the, into the football field and use a sickle and, and cut down the tall grass. Even learn how to iron clothes. And nowadays, my wife didn't like me to iron, iron clothes because I took all her, um, what do you call it, the lines on it, and I took them all out, the pleats. She said, stop ironing anymore. So... I don't iron anymore, but we learned everything there. And it was a good experience for us because we brought this with us to our adult lives. Uh, I remember the food. It was not gourmet as everybody remembers. Dinners weren't always tasty. Uh, I remember someone telling me, don't worry, we have breakfast tomorrow morning at six o'clock. So in other words, eat it or forget it. Uh, we never got ribeye that, in, that, in that home. Uh, but what I enjoyed was the outings that we take, had taken. We went to uh, Santa, Santa Cruz Boardwalk, had a great time there. If you remember the San Francisco Fun House by the beach, that was a lot of fun. And the best thing that ever happened to us was going to uh, Camp Timbertal in Mendocino. We had a week camping and that was a wonderful time there. So I remember all the good times and those oversaw the negative parts that we had. I remember when we had sandwiches that sometimes the salami was a little green on the outside. I would just cut it off, and eat the rest of it. And I remember candy bars, if they had nuts in them, seemed to have worms in them. So I just poke, take the worms out and eat the chocolate. This is what you do to survive, you know? So, um, my life in Jungmei was personally a very, very happy time. I had, especially in my developing years, and I have no regrets about it. And as I look back about Jungmei, I'm very proud of it. As I get older, even more proud of what happened 
and how, what turned out. And uh, maybe because I was younger, I didn't have any negative feelings about it. Uh, but what I remember clearly, I still recite it to my family, to my friends, is the Jungmei alphabet. And that is our Jungmei Ten Commandments. And I would like to read it to you. I have it memorized, but if I read it, I can do a better job. It's the Jungmei alphabet. A. Always does his best. B. Bears burdens cheerfully. C. Can do whatever he makes up his mind to do. Dares to do right. Endures hardships like a good soldier. Fights the good fight. Gives to those in need. Is honest. Inspires others to do right. Is just. Kind to all persons and animals. Is loyal. Manly at all times. Never gives up. Obeys orders promptly and cheerfully, even if it's from the wife. Pol polite at all times. Quarrels never. Runs the straight race. Shuns evil companions. Trustworthy. Unselfish. Valiant. Willing worker, exemplary in behavior, yields not into temptation, but is full of zip. And I've, I've made copies of that and give it to my, my children so he can pass it on to our grandchildren. I give it to my brother-in-laws to give to their kids. Uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, Ten Commandments for, for younger people. And I'm very proud of it, and I've carried it uh, into the... To the, to the present, it's done very well uh, for me. And you wanted to know what did I what did I do after I left Jungmei? Well, I went to school in, in Oakland, and then I went to UC Berkeley, and then I transferred over to the uh, UCSF School of Pharmacy, and I graduated from the School of Pharmacy there, and eventually I had a pharmacy of my own in Livermore. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. So, uh, if I had to do, do it over again, I would do the same thing. I, I had a friend I was playing golf with and we talked about our, last, our life. And I told him about Jungmei and I told him about what I did for the kids and what it was all about. He says, can I send my kids there? So that's kind of what I feel about it and what his impression was. I said, sorry, it's, it's closed down. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Now we'll have Phil Chan, who was my roommate before he left, 1944 to 1952. Phil, you're on. Thank you for the honor of being able to go back into all our memories. And Paul, you've taken all my thunder. <laughs> One of the hardest things for me when we first went to Jongmei was leaving my parents. That was tremendous. I was older, being 11, you know, losing the family. Paul didn't feel the same thing that I did. So it was, it was an adjustment that we had, that I had to make. But over a short period of time, I, I met new friends and I got to do all of the things that he talked about. When you saw all the pictures of all the boys with the brush your teeth, at the home, they had two bathtubs side by side. Why? Because myself being the older one, we would wash the boys at both sides. They have two of us and we would give them a bath whenever they needed it. And that was one of the things that I did. One of the things about Dome and Captain was discipline. You know, as we talk about what things went on and went on, everything was by, by the bell. We hear a bell to get up, a bell to go to eat, a bell to go to bed. We had a bell, and that was our discipline. We got our religious church because we went to the Baptist church in Berkeley. That's where we got uh, um, my uh, baptismal that was in, in Berkeley. And we all went, we had a, uh, all of us had the opportunity of going, going to church. It's like 
schools. I went to El Cerrito High School. It was a junior and senior high school at the time. So in the single school, I went from sixth grade to the time I graduated in 52. While I was there, I went out for track, you know, participated in sports. And that, that was a wonderful thing. One of the things uh, when I left, I know you saw pictures of our gymnasium. Well, in the early days, in order to receive, get money for that, I used to go with, with, with the truck and the other boys into Richmond and we would collect newspapers. And we would do this week after week after week that we would bring them back to the garage and we would lay them flat out. And they, and they said, uh, Captain said, we got the best price when we sell them to Florida. They liked all the flat newspapers. And that was part of, part of our job. I remember in the early years when we had a football team. I, I was too small to participate, but we enjoyed it. And Tom, you, you mentioned about how they did. And uh, being small, I guess some of the other schools, they were also big, was pretty tough to compete. But I remember you talked about the basketball team. I, was, I had left the home at that point in time. And I, when I look at that, at the gymnasium, I was part of the group that helped build that. One of the things you showed in the pictures was the parade. Paul and I were part of the, uh, we, were, we were in the pictures. Both he and I were drummers and we enjoyed that. In fact, in one of the rooms in the, in the home there, I used to work with pencil and use the gratty tap tap, gratty tap tap, gratty tap tap. Trouble is I broke all my lips. <laughs> also, we also use that room for Chinese lessons. Unfortunately, my Chinese is pretty bad, but the Chinese teacher would write a complete script against the wall. He said, if you memorize that, you can leave. So we were very good at memorizing, but I don't know what I memorized. <laughs> Things that I enjoyed over the period of time was, like you said, Camp Timbertoe. That was wonderful. We used to go fishing out there, we would get and we would fish for crabs, and we would cook them, eat them out, 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 out there. Now, I remember we stayed overnight in Cuba sleeping bags, except it got kind of cold out there. And we would stay overnight, and we'd go fishing and the next day on the beaches of Camp Minotino. Those were glory days. I think things that we learned were things that helped me in the future. I got a job of working with a company called Cisco Food Service. I did that for 38 years. And my wife was a teacher. And when I retired, we had a chance to travel around the world. But the things that I remember are things of Song Mei and what it meant to me. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And now for our last panelist, we have William Lee. William was 1940 to 1950. And William, is that correct? 1940 to 1950? That's correct. And you have seven minutes to wind up the panel. Okay. Okay. Uh, already got my thunder stolen already from uh, Paul and Philip. <laughs> uh, I was going to do the Chome alphabet. But uh, when I got into the home, it was 1940, and I was uh, five years old. And uh, I was the youngest guy there because I had to be five years old to get in. And I, that's when they let me in, when I was eligible. So from there, we had the long journey. In the war years, I remember we were doing a lot of paper routes and fixing the papers and earning money to build a gym and all that other stuff. And uh, things were okay. It was a happy childhood. We, uh, 
we probably didn't get to do as much as many of the other kids did, but, uh, you know, there were a lot of other kids to do things with, so that was a good thing. <clears throat> I was going to go, you know, oh, in 1940, when I first got in, uh, the uh, me, I mean, the uh, purpose was what was used when Captain uh, would bring us in the chapel. And it, it says, it goes like this. Uh, it is the purpose, he called it the Chongmei purpose. It is the purpose of every loyal Chongmei boy to promote within the home habits of reverence, obedience, discipline, courtesy, self-respect, and all that tends toward true Christian manliness. He tried to, Captain tried to make us all men. He tried to turn his boys into men, men that he thought we should be. That's why he came up with the alphabet. And he also came up with the uh, Chongmei Chan, which was there in 1940. The, the alphabet came in 45 after the war. But the Chongmei Chan goes like this. God is a refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Oh, that man should praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. For it's easy enough to be happy when life flows along like a song. But the man worthwhile is the man that can smile when things go dead wrong. So acquit yourselves like men, be strong. And though everything seems dead against you, carry on, carry on, carry on. Good words that in Many times in my life when things were a little bit rocky, it kept me balanced. Thank you. Thank you, William. Since I have a couple of minutes, I think I'm going to add up my experience in Chung Mei. There was a question and answer, what is Chung Mei? Chung is for Chung Kok, the China, and Mei is Mei Kok, is, is US. So. Dr. Shepard combined the word Chung and Mei with China and US. Now, everybody covered a lot of things that was interesting, but I think the most interesting thing that happened to me was that Captain practiced picture language. In, in Japanese, it was known as Kintsugi, which is the artistic practice of putting broken ceramics back together with a golden lacquer that adorns the former fracture lines. So the point is not to repair and make an object whole again, but to honor its history rather than to minimize it. Now, what I say is that was that I did something wrong and I was in his office and he said, Richard, you know, it's like breaking a beautiful ceramic piece. I can put it back together again, but the lines, the reputation, my faith in you, there's always lines. He punished me by, he did not punish me enough because I was back in the office again, maybe several months, and because I was out of bounds. And he said, Richard, I am not gonna punish you because you have been such a good person I am going to debit from your bank of good behavior and offset what you did being, being out of bounds so I was not punished. I remember that. Those two values point. Kindness, good to all persons, animal, and be compassionate. Those are the values that I think everybody mentioned during this panel discussion. So as far as I was concerned, I played the game, I got along very well, and I was very happy because I learned the values, because if it wasn't for 
the disciplinary military action of the home, I would be elsewhere. So I give credit to Captain. And now we will have a question and answer period. And I turn it over to David. David? Thank you, Richard. So we have um, a couple questions and um, I will just pick uh, amongst a few of them. Uh, there's a few questions that are, that are kind of similar. So I'm gonna kind of put them all together. Um, would any of the panelists um, be um, able to share if you were able to reconnect with your family, your biological families or your parents at some point during your life? And then what, what, what was that like? Paul? Oh. Yes, uh, at, we moved back to it with my mother, and we had a wonderful relationship with her. Uh, my mom uh, was taught by Phil about fishing, and she took it up really heavy. She used to go salmon fishing out the gate, go fishing up in the, in the Delta, uh, went to Arizona to fish for trout, and she loved fishing. And um, they caught a striper, a striped bass in uh, Vallejo, 44 pounds and they had it mounted and I have it still in my garage hanging from my garage because no one wanted it but uh, they <laughs> love fishing and uh, uh, we had a great relationship with her uh, later years she moved to Castro Valley and I was in Dublin and I used to provide food for her send her, her medicine whatever she needed and doing I did her shopping and she would give me a list uh buy the beans at Safeway because it's cheaper than Lucky's and buy this <laughs> at Lucky's because it's cheaper than Safeway. I said, mom, I'll give you the money difference and I'll just buy it all at one store. But I was always there for her and uh, she was good to me. And maybe it was a second chance for her, a chance for me to reunite with her. So it turned out very well, very well. Uh, one other thing, I saw a question there about the ABCs. And uh, if anybody wants a copy of the alphabet, email me at P Chan Jr. P C H A N J R at yahoo.com and have your email address and I will email you a copy of the uh, the Jungmei alphabet. Uh, I've given it to all my family, friends, and they all really love it. So uh, I think it should be spread out to everybody. Another question, David? David? Leave the home. Did you get adopted or did, did you uh, reach a certain age and then you uh, became? Say again, David. I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? We can't hear you, David. Can you please repeat the question? Oops. Sorry, uh, technical difficulties. Um, so uh, one question was basically, um, in what, when did you graduate or leave the orphanage? And when, um, and did some of you get adopted? You should say it's not an orphanage. It's it's an orphanage. Bill, would you like to answer the question about we're, adoption? We were never adopted. You know, when I graduated from, from when I left Zhongmei, I, I went to live with my mom, then I went, I went to Berkeley. Other, same thing with Paul. Neither of us were adopted by another family. Actually, when you think of an adoption, we always thought of Zhongmei as being adopted to Zhongmei. I understand, Paul, they want, to, they want you to put your email address on the screen. If you can give that. Uh, uh, how do I do that? Put it on the chat. On the chat. Okay. Let's see. I think somebody already put it there. Did they? It's P Chan J R at yahoo.com. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what's in the chat. Okay. Right. If you have any problems, I can take care of it because uh, Bill made, William Lee made this alphabet on a piece of wood for his uh, 70th <laughs> birth, uh, for his 80th birthday. So, so Bill, <laughs> William, Bill, maybe, 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 maybe you would like to send this out to all the people who request it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay, any more questions? We got to have a lot more questions. You know, hey, Richard? Man. Yes, we do, actually. Um, so uh, the, the next question is, let me, um, how was the Chome funded? Like, where did it get its money to, to, to run the operation? I think the, the American Baptist Church gave some money, but our parents had to pay a, a small sum for the upkeep of both Paul and I. I don't know what it was, but I, I think know it was around fifty dollars a month. Is that what it was? I didn't know. I, I what believe it was. so. Fifty dollars a month <laughs> for each of us. Yeah. Yeah. Say something. Yeah. Uh, let me just type in here as well. Uh, the the parents normally paid, um, and certainly the Baptist Church provided money. Um, but, you know, they literally made money by performances from their wood yard, uh, from the band, from other things. But then also, uh, the captain was an extraordinary fundraiser. I mean, at the Historical Society, we, we have, um, fortunate to have copies of all the newsletters that he would send out. Like, he was constantly asking for money, and he was pretty successful. I look back on, on history when Captain bought the um, house in Berkeley, he didn't know that it would be the freeway that would go through it. And so when he, when he, when he, uh, they took the house, they gave him enough money to buy El Cerrito. Any more questions? Yes, uh, another hopefully quick question. <laughs> Um, how have you, uh, as a group, stayed in touch over the years? Do you have regular reunions? I think so. Say, speak, Will. Yeah, we, we have, just talk. We had some, some oh, reunions, wow. and uh, I remember uh, we had one that we all went to the home. Uh, gee, that was about 2005. Yeah, excuse me, but can't remember all these, uh, all these oh, dates. Can I offer something? Yeah, go ahead. You know, we had a reunion in 2003, and I was able to uh, uh, put out a, a little video about what I knew about the, about the home. And that's kind of the genesis of, of the interest in the home. That's how we got ended up with, I think Tom got involved when, when we had a reunion. Is that true, Tom? Yes, that is. And then, of course, your El Cerrito Historical Society uh, uh, did a, an article, and we had, they asked us to be there when they, when they did a tour through the home. I know that was part of your El Cerrito Historical Society uh, group that came to El Cerrito. I mean, came to Tomei. I saw a question there as to where was the Tomei home in El Cerrito. It's on the, uh, at Hill and Elm Street. It is still there. Yes. Um, <laughs> and it is a, a functioning school. And there was a question in the chat about, can you visit it? Um, you can only visit normally, like maybe once every few years, the historical society or another organization might arrange to run a tour. But it is a, it's a very busy school, and so uh, people can't just, you know, even over the weekends, so people can't just go there and look around without shepherds. And I also want to say, like, you know, I, I keep seeing a few questions in the chat about orphans and orphanages. Like, as far as I know, all the kids who were there actually had parents, but due to various circumstances, 
the parents either couldn't afford to or were unable to take care of the kids. I was a real orphan. Oh, were, were you, Mr. <laughs> William? Okay. Um, I think you were the exception, and one of the exceptions, I was really right? Yeah. Um, I guess one question I, uh, that uh, came up is um, when you were in the orphanage, I, you know, it was also a time where there might have been some discrimination uh, against Chinese um, and um, perhaps even uh, stigmat stigmatizing because people would refer to you as orphans. Uh, how did you feel about that and, 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 and what was your perspective on it or, or did it not affect you? You know, at school, we never, I, didn't, we, I never felt the, the stigma of being different from everybody else. Because when I was in elementary and high school, the, 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 we did not have this black, white, yellow differences. I mean, we were all one group. That's, that's the way I felt. I did not really feel any, any discrimination at all. Same here. When I was in five years younger than Phil, and went to uh, stage school in Richmond, and then Castro School in uh, 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 El Cerrito, and went to Port Law Junior High School, and uh, there was never any discrimination. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship with, with other students, and uh, part of this, our personalities, we blend in because we learn how to get along with others, so we weren't a rattle, we didn't ever cause any problems, so it was easy to make friends r rather than enemies. All right, Richard and, and William. Yes. Yeah. Any other question? Are there any other question, David? Um, do we have to, if we have time for more questions? Um, yeah, a couple of questions. There was one question there. Were there any children other than Chinese? And no, there was not. I think one of the uh, one of the helpers I can't remember her name had a boy that stayed there with him, mm -hmm. and he was Caucasian. But it was it was the son of one of the people that worked there. I can't rem remember who that was. You know, I understand Captain when the school was closing in 1954 before it closed uh, that the state of California wanted to add other grace group other uh, races to go to Chongmei. And I think uh, Captain said, no, he only wanted it for the Chinese because it was, you know, he, he did not want to have it for, uh, in other words, an open school of, of other groups. And I think that's one of the reasons why he refused. I, 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 anyway, that's what I understand. I, I think that had something to do with his grandson, uh, uh, used to play in the uh, yards with us kids. And uh, uh, I remember his grandson threw a rock and hit me in the head. I had a oh, big yeah. gash behind my, my head with this. And uh, he never got punished. He just, you know, <laughs> he just, we just didn't see him much anymore after that. <laughs> but nobody beat him up or anything, but, you know, he... Uh, I guess I, Captain, you know, I've heard I many of you yeah, have heard. Mm. You ever have I to walk around the cycle? Yeah, whenever you got punished, and and uh, I don't know, I don't know what you know. He had the penal list, and he had the uh, walk around the flagpole, but it, <laughs> it it wasn't so consistent as other things that he normally did which was consistent and, and he ran the home pretty well because he was consistent. But that walk around the flagpole, it's like, mm. and then he'd forget about you. You can walk around the flagpole for about three hours. And then all of a sudden he says, oh, you know, and then he'll let you go. But I saw never, a question there. You never, knew, you never knew how serious the offense was for him to make you walk around the flagpole or for how long. Right. Tom, but but the when he gave out the penal list, the, the, the list tells 
everybody, what they did, what they did wrong, made them think about it, <laughs> then, you know, everything was okay. But that walking around the flagpole, it was just not, not. <laughs> uh, there was a question about whether there are any girls at, at Jungmei, and the answer is no, because uh, Dr. Shepard met Donaldina Cameron in San Francisco, and she had a home for girls. And uh, later on, there is a home for girls called Ming Guang that was in Oakland. So the girls would go to Ming Guang, and the boys were at Jungmei. So the question for the Ming Guang, the, we're going to have a webinar later on, maybe in September, October. And Nona Mark Wyman, who wrote Bamboo, will probably help out and answer the questions as far as the girls are concerned. There's another question about the file uh, records. Uh, Tom, do you know anything about that? Where are the files or records or anything that you have in the El Cerrito Historical Society? Um, the El Cerrito Historical Society has certainly not, um, you know, records per se, of the kids, like, you know, a file on every kid. But we have accumulated a lot of material about the school as, we, as well as additional material about subsequent uses. But, you know, to me, like, one of the most, the two most important things we have are, like, photographs we've been able to collect. And then also um, the Chung Mei Chronicles, which I think are were, like, for many years, a kind of a weekly, very short, newspaper that described what was going on at the school. Um, I know that at uh, the Redwood Glen School in San Mateo County up in the Redwoods, um, they have a fairly good collection there as well. And other people may have other collections, but like, you know, some of the stuff that come actually came from, we have actually, for example, the Chiang Mai Chronicles actually came from Dr one of Dr. Shepard's granddaughters who had it. I have another answer. Someone asked me about the Jungmei alphabet. And uh, years ago, I think Tom had a, a meeting with the El Cerrito Historical Society about Jungmei. And I went, that, Phil told me about it and I went there. And uh, I think you asked me, uh, does anybody or this, uh, us, anybody knew the alphabet? So I said, yeah, I know it. So I, I, I went and said the alphabet and that was that. So a month later, Phil says, Paul, you're on YouTube. I said, from what? The time you, you had taped the, uh, the, the, the meeting and there I was reciting the uh, alphabet. And as I watched it, I left one letter out but I can't re remember what it was, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's on YouTube. <laughs> um, we I was surprised it was televised. We do have a few more questions. Uh, one of them is that you've mentioned Captain quite a bit. Uh, can any of you describe who, who Captain was and a little bit about his character? Well, I can answer from my point of view. First of all, Captain Dr. Charles R. Shepard had a PhD in philosophy. And I gave you a couple of examples. What he did was picture language, uh, and he also mentioned about debiting the bank of good behavior, offsetting the errors. Those are the things that I remember as far as I'm concerned. He was very fair, but he's very strict. So if you didn't behave, you would get punished under the penal code. They call it penal. On Saturday morning, there was a slip of paper on a spindle. And it, and it was at our chapel meeting. And all, we would say, uh-oh, who's going to go to work now? And the slip of paper were written by our house group mothers, like, Phil did not behave properly, and they wrote something wrong, that maybe he went out of bounds, or Paul did something wrong, or whatever. And there's a slip of paper. And he would met out the punishment according to what you did. And this was called Pino. It could be one hour sweeping the floors, two hours cutting grass, four hours doing dishes in the staff kitchen, or six hours 
going down the field, cutting grass. So it, it was, uh, shall we say, was it fair? Well, for me, if I did something wrong, I didn't think it was fair, but I guess from his point of view, it was fair. It was a military style school for 77 boys. So it was very difficult to be fair to everybody equally all the time. I'd like to add that before Dr. Shepard ended up in San Francisco, he had been a Baptist missionary in China and that's where he learned Chinese to read and write Chinese. And I believe he went back to St. Louis after that, but they, he shortly thereafter ended up in San Francisco because of the large Asian population in San Francisco and started working uh, still as a minister, um, but working to provide services to uh, severely underserved Chinese youth. And that's where I met Donalina Cameron as well. Thank you, and they had it. We have time for more questions? A couple more questions, and we're going to go to the closing statements. Great. Okay, so... Uh, some of you have been there at different times, but some of uh, it seems like some of you were there during World War II and perhaps some of the sub sub subsequent wars. Did, th did that affect you in any way? No, no, no. Oh, uh, Bill, uh, you were there in 1940. What's the question? Huh? I didn't get the question. Uh, did the war have any your fate i'm i'm getting the fade here you guys are freezing and uh, the question was like how were you impacted by either the uh korean war or before that world war ii oh. if at all both of us we were too young yeah i i went i went to i went to uh in other words i'm a korean war veteran but but i'm not that old <laughs> 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 I can't say that well, during the yeah during the war during the war I was a little guy you know forty to forty five and uh, we were pretty well clustered because we were little we couldn't do anything from you know if you're in the home you're a junior or low intermediate you can't go anywhere so you're your whole bounds are in the home, so it it never it it never was a problem uh, because we were so sheltered. Yeah, let me share something with you. In my retirement, we got a chance to go to Seoul, Korea, and in Seoul, Korea, they have on the wall the names of all the U.S. servicemen that were lost in the war, and a second wall. All of the all of the South Koreans. I took a video of it, which I don't have now. Clarence Chan was listed on the wall in in Seoul, Korea. So he's he's it's like the, like they have in, in Washington D.C. They have one in, in Seoul, Korea. I thought that was interesting. The only thing that really impacted me was when Captain at the chapel service in the morning mentioned and said that Clarence Chan is missing in action and he actually cried in front of us at the chapel service. So that's the only thing that I, only time that I actually saw Captain in sorrow. That was my take as far as 19, when Clarence Chan was missing in an action. Right. The, well, like I say, I, I saw his name on the wall. Yeah. Okay, let's let's wrap this up. We're going to have the closing statements. So each member of the panel will have a couple of minutes to wind up and contribute to this webinar, and then we'll have uh, Erwin come in to close this webinar. We don't want we don't want to go over one hour and twelve minutes because I know that all the People are watching are very tired and we're not that young either. So 
Tom, would you start up with your wind up closing statement? Thank you so much, Richard. I, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, CHCP for putting together this event. It's so important that we understand our history. And when you look at both the Chung Mei home and Ming Kwan home, these were like the very, very, very few examples of where a Chinese person could actually live outside of Chinatown because there was just blatant, you know, um, housing discrimination against the Chinese in those days. Yeah. And I want to point out like one of the reasons why the Chiang Mai Hong closed in 1954 because like yeah. after the war, yeah. while the Japanese really became yeah. pariahs after World War II, uh, the Chinese who had been American allies and, and men and some number of Chinese young men had gone to war for the United States were much more highly appreciated than they might have been before. And also at that point, you know, interracial, um, not so much adoptions, although adoptions, but you could have interracial foster parents, which have been illegal um, until about 1952, 1953, I think. And that's another reason why um, the home was not needed the way it was. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is like a huge part of history. Obviously that building is a very important the history of El Cerrito. Um, and El Cerrito has just always been, an, I feel so fortunate, we've always been a very diverse and accepting place. It's just a treat to have served all these people. Thank you, Tom. Paul, you'd uh, like to give a closing statement? of World War II, uh, my Aunt B, uh, a daughter, married General Claire Chenault, who, who started the Flying Tigers in China. He was from Louisiana, and Phil and I met him, and uh, when he was coming back from overseas, we met him in Piedmont when he came, came back home. So we, I can't say we're related to him, but we did meet him, and I was only like seven or eight years old when he came back from China. And he was a hero to the Chinese because uh, when the Japanese were over China, they, it's like going on a picnic and just dropping bombs wherever they wanted to because there was no opposition. And then the so-called American volunteer group that he led over there flew P-40s that were given back to the US. They were meant for, um, to fight the German fighters, which were too good for the P-40s. So China bought them. General Chenault taught them how to fly in, in pairs. And he would go up and intercept the Japanese. And they're going, what the F is going on here? This is supposed to be a vacation. And they're going to get shot down. And so he became a hero. And if you go to, to Taiwan, there's a big plaque with uh, General Chenault uh, with uh, Chiang Kai-shek in, uh, in the museum. So I can say I met him. And also out in Livermore about a year ago, two years ago, we had a flying tiger day at the uh, Armed Forces Day. And so I went there and saw pictures of General Chenault and I met a pilot who flew in Italy and then flew for flying tigers in China. And he was 90, 95 years old. And he was supposed to fly to the Livermore Airport from, from um, Santa Rosa, but it was bad weather. But I got a picture with him, but he shot down plot, uh, German planes in, in Italy and in China. So. A little bit of history. Yeah. So. Okay, Bill, your closing statement. Well, you know, I think uh, it's this wonderful to be able to share memories uh, with everyone here and have a less we forget of our of our of our heritage. And I think that's the key thing that I really thank Tom for what you have done, and I thank everyone for participating. I think the keynote to us all was 2003 when we had the reunion and that, that initiated all of this. And I wanna thank everyone uh, who was able to participate. And I hope uh, as we go forward, we can have our grandchildren know our history. I don't want them to forget that. Tom, thank you, I hope Phil. So down the road that you can have another open house at, at Jungmei somewhere down the road if possible <laughs> yeah tom that's the 100th anniversary i'm not going to be around but uh, you, you're going to take care of nine, 2035 okay william okay your closing statement i want to i want to say that uh captain bill 
strong character for us all. And <laughs> just by following the alphabet, I think he, I think that's what he tried to do in his uh, talks, is to make us all men, build the alphabet says it all. Okay, thank you, panelists. Now, what I have to say, I'd like to thank Erwin Wong, director of CCHP, Dr. Christian Jokum of San Jose State University, CCHP member, David Wu, CCH member, Edith Gong, who did the bulletin, and his vice president, and Gail Chong, CCHP. I also would like to acknowledge Steve and Susan Chamberlain of the Chamberlain Family Foundation, who improved the Jungmei building with the elevator and leased it to the Summit Public Schools in 2012. And kudos to Dora Granera to be one of the early graduates of Summit School High School at Jungmei, who will be attending Boston University in September. So Joe May is alive, we will not be around, but the graduates will be participating and spreading the good news and kindness and compassion of Dr. Charles R. Shepard. So ladies and gentlemen, friends of Joe May, thank you for participating in the seminar and attending the seminar. And I'd like to turn control of the meeting back to Erwin Wong. Erwin. Wow. That was the most enjoyable webinar. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for hosting this um, uh, webinar. Uh, we have uh, we have at least seventy two questions, and um, we couldn't answer all of them. But uh, talking to Chris uh, Jokin, uh, we could do our best to uh, answer those questions that weren't answered uh, during the webinar, and we're going to post it on our um, web, uh, on our uh, web, chcp.org. And I'm gonna have uh, Richard uh, take control of, uh, of answering as many of those questions from his panelists. So anyway, with that, um, you know, I, I just wanna thank, uh, you know, uh, Richard Marr uh, as being the host and Tom Panis, Paul Chan, Phil Chen and William Lee for their participation on this webinar. It was very enjoyable. And I hope all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. And as a reminder, um, we will be presenting next month the Ming Kwang Home for uh, the Chinese Girls uh, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And we're looking toward around September timeframe. So Stay tuned. Uh, this now, unfortunately, is the end of our webinar. And, uh, and again, thanks for coming to our webinar. And so uh, with this said, please stay healthy and be safe. And have a great day. Bye. For